Hi, I'm Mary Harrell for Tan Books. Peanut butter and jelly, spaghetti and meatballs, Catholic kids lit, and Katie Warner. Some things just are better together. And Katie is here today to talk about her newest book, which takes us inside a day in the life of a Dominican cloistered monastery and the sisters that live within its walls. Take a look. Pretty darn cute. Katie's here with us today. As I said, she's a Catholic homeschooling mom. She's the author and editor of the First Faith Treasury series that you can find here on Tan Books. Her other picture books include Father Ben Gets Ready for Mass, Lily Lilek, Future Saint, and Listening for God, Silence Practice for Little Ones. Katie also writes for the National Catholic Register and helps others come to the church through Catholics Come Home. Katie, thanks for joining us. It's so good to be with you, Mary. Katie, how did you get to this picture book about Sister Claire? How did you pick the Dominicans? What was your inspiration behind this? Yeah, so we knew for a while after the popularity of Father Ben Gets Ready for Mass that we wanted to do a book for religious sisters. I think it's a much lesser known and understood life. For most, um, most Catholics have never been to the grounds of a cloister, cloister, let alone inside of a convent. So we thought it'd be really neat to give people a look inside and to help them experience a day in the life of a cloister nun. One of my dear friends from graduate school had actually been discerning her vocation with the contemplative Dominicans and made her final vows during the process of Meg and I working on this book. So she and I wrote letters back and forth about her daily routine, and I used her schedule as the basis for the storyline. So the timing of her solemn profession couldn't have come at a more Holy Spirit-driven time because Meg and I got to attend, and Meg was able to get a really good look at the grounds and the chapel and um, was able to base much of the artwork on the actual monastery. So we, in the end, and received uh, permission from the prioress to include a photo of our friend, Sister Dominic Mary of Mercy, um, that she took with us while we were at her solemn profession in the back of the book. So it's really fun for kids to get to the end of the book and then to see the real life nun that has ties to the story. Wow. Just like in thinking about how the apostles were real people, you know, the saints are real people. Religious sisters are real people. They are not made of plaster. They're actual real flesh and blood, right? You know, as I've mentioned before, many, you know, very few Catholics really know much of anything about this type of religious life, specifically life in a cloister. We see priests and active sisters very, you know, fairly often, but the life of a contemplative monk or nun is reserved. And so it's kind of mysterious to us. And it's funny because one of our test readers, one of our pre-readers was actually surprised. I maybe shocked is a better word for it to see Sister Claire napping and playing during her typical day. And I think many of us without realizing it can kind of picture nuns just kneeling and praying all day long. And trust me, they definitely do a lot of praying, but there's actually a lot more to their day. It's filled with chores and work and rest and leisure. And the books makes all of that tangible and sort of peels back the curtain on what's really going on in a convent behind those closed doors. So these are women who still need to run their home and grow together as a family. And my sister or my friend, Sister Dominic Mary, um, has told me before that her life is very much similar to our family life. There's sisters that you're close to and sisters that you don't really get along with. And there are chores and tasks that you don't always feel like doing and you're required to be obedient to the superior. But then there's also so many joys, again, 
in as in family life, getting to grow in holiness together and celebrate the prayer, celebrate, you know, or pray together and celebrate the sacraments together and do liturgical living together, play games and laugh and make memories. And so I think that, and I hope that children will really enjoy experiencing all of this throughout the book, Sister Claire Gets Ready for Prayer, and adults can maybe even learn a little bit along the way too. Kitty, you made a great decision, I think, in this book in that you would break what they call the fourth wall in that you actually talk to the reader and you ask the reader, probably a child, to light a candle or to say a little prayer with you or to stand up, sit down, kneel down, all those things. How did you come to that decision that that would be your tone for the book? Yeah. So I really like this aspect of Sister Claire. Like you mentioned, the children are invited to interact on every page. So they'll sing, they'll count, they'll move around, they'll talk about what they would do in their free time if they were a nun, um, pray with the sisters and more. Having this participatory element of the story really brings the whole book to life and I think makes it an experience and not just a book. Um, it kind of allows you to create memories as a family and it makes the book really fun in a way that has the child asking for repeat readings, and then also delights the adult who gets to engage with the child in the story. It also just helps with memory, having these kind of tactile ways to um, interact with the story as you're going along really cements the, um, the teachings of the book in the memory of the child. I was actually really surprised, honestly, Mary, that all of my kids from toddler to the almost 10 year old um, really loved the prompts and uh, to connect with the book and then also sharing their thoughts. It was such a joy for me um, the first time I read it with them. And I learned things about my kids in the process too, which was really fun. That's darling. So I was just going to ask, what inspires you with your own kids? I'm sure you do a lot of reading at home, both your kids reading and, and read alouds. What are some of the stories or authors or book series that have inspired you as a family in your literary journey together? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that one of the things that helps us tremendously in in helping to foster vocations in our children and teach them about vocations is just good books. So we really immerse ourselves in the lives of the saints. I love tan series from Mary Fabian Windia. All of those saint chapter books are just fabulous. And we, um, we're always in the middle of reading one as one of our read alouds and the kids know they can pretty, ex pretty much expect me to cry at some point during those <laughs> books. They're just, the, the stories are so touching and immersive. And I, I think just reading and studying the saints together is probably one of the capstones of our, you know, theology at home with the kids. We always make sure that we're spending time every day in the Bible together and in the lives of the saints. And it really, creates a lot of amazing conversations. Also because as kids, I don't think my husband and I really immersed ourselves in the lives of the saints um, nearly as much as our children are able to do now. And so we're often learning for the first time what's going on in the lives of these saints, applying it to our own lives. And it's really amazing to see my children bring up the saints in everyday life and experiences as if they were their friends. And that's who they're meant to be. They're meant to be our friends in heaven. And it's neat to have um, children today through great books, be able to bring their faith in a tangible way into the home and in a way that they can discuss those things with their parents and see their lives reflected in the books. And then also see what they're learning in the books reflected in their own lives. Mm. Makes for great conversations around the dinner table when you can bring in saints you've read stuff that's happened to you and bring it back to your family life. Incredible. Katie, the aspect, I mentioned this to someone on, on Instagram, I think about Sister Claire Gets Ready for Prayer, about how many vocations Katie Warner is going to influence in her writing career and beyond. But do you think about that, that little girls could be looking at this book and thinking, hey, this could be me. I could be taking a nap in a monastery someday wearing white and black, right? I do. I do genuinely hope and pray for that, Mary. Like one of our regular prayer intentions in the evening as a family is for our first faith treasury readers. And I do pray for future vocations to come from this. My daughter, my five-year-old just told me for the first time the other day after, you know, we had read Sister Claire a week before that, that she thinks it'd be really cool to be a nun when she grows up. And that wasn't a thought that she had ever expressed before. So I knew that it was the book that kind of got that just even stirring in her head. Um, I'm just, I was amazed 
all of the thought provoking questions and discussions that came from my kids during and after reading Sister Claire with them for the first time. And we've been able to continue those discussions. I think that really all parents and godparents and teachers and grandparents um, can really do just a few simple things that allow this fostering of vocations to be something very doable in their own homes. And one of them, as I mentioned, is through books, um, reading books like Sister Claire Gets Ready for Prayer. You mentioned Father Ben Gets Ready for Mass. We also have a book called Jack Giorgio, Future Priest, that also highlights the priesthood really beautifully. And then um, another fairly newer title, um, One Holy Marriage, the story of Saints Louis and Zaylee Martin. And reading books that highlight the sacraments, whether that's the religious life or the vocation to marriage, I think really helps children kind of make that vocation a little bit more tangible so they can see what living that vocation is really like. Um, and then also prayer, like I mentioned, we make praying for our children's future vocations a daily habit. We teach them how to pray for their future vocations, whether that be to marriage or to the religious life. And then we also pray for vocations in general, which can be as easy as just making that one of the intentions in your regular family rosary. Um, and then finally, I think relationships is another really good way to foster vocations with our kids. So that means giving our kids a chance to be around with, to talk with, and to learn from Catholics um, in various vocations. So inviting your parish priest over for dinner or getting to know the sisters at a local Catholic school or order, um, taking pilgrimages to spend time at a monastery or convent so your child can see and pray with monks and nuns who have given their life to Christ in the church. Um, to, and, then, and then also even with the vocation of marriage, we can help them better understand and appreciate the vocation of marriage by talking about our wedding day, about our vows, and letting our children experience the real joy of married life by intentionally caring for one another and growing in holiness together in a way that's visible to the kids. I was just telling my husband that, that in the same way that we take kids to go visit colleges when they get to that high school level, think of, can you picture yourself here? We should do that with seminaries. We should do that with monasteries. Can you picture yourself here? Do you see this as a life you could see yourself in? But that's not always in the, the psyche of the parent today is take them to that kind of place. Yeah, my husband just got back from having a silent retreat at a Benedictine monastery. And immediately wow. upon his return, we knew that he want, we wanted him to bring the boys in a few years. Mm -hmm. um, because just being able to see their way of life, like I said, for most of us, is just mysterious. We kind of as I mentioned before, we kind of picture them just kneeling and praying all day. And that is a big part of their life, but also seeing the way they relate to each other, the way they work, the way they follow a yeah. rule. And all of that is so helpful for our kids. It makes it less of, you know, less of just some imaginary lifestyle in their head and more of a real thing and real people and real faces really radically giving their life to God in this way. And then seeing that it brings them joy. I feel like, especially in our culture today, that's looked at as really a, a crazy form of life. And it is radical, but it's radically beautiful. And I don't think you could really understand that unless you saw it for yourself. And so even again, bringing, you know, your family to a monastery where they can even hear the nuns choir singing through the mass, like that's such a beautiful opportunity that you can't get at a parish church um, that I think is really helpful and formative as children kind of flesh out and begin to pray and discern God. God's call for their own life. Right. <clears throat> or just leaving that, that mark on their soul that when I was little, I went and heard this choir somewhere and I was none. I was never the same. I never forgot it. And I had hearing those voices. Yeah. Chills. Give me chills. Sure. And, and I, would say, I would say, Mary, too, like even um, just the, I, I know my husband was just inspired by that level of piety, you know, like sure. just how, how, in the midst of our vocation, you know, in family life, prayer looks very different <laughs> than it looks like in a monastery or convent. And it can be a good reminder for children and adults just to really give your heart very fully to prayer in those moments you are able to be in silent prayer with God, you know, because you can move mountains in your own life if you just make more time for that that quiet time with the Lord, for allowing him to speak to your heart. As you mentioned, we have another book called Listening for God that helps children recognize that silent time is so important because that's when God's going to speak to your heart. He's going to draw closer to you. You're going to develop a friendship with him that allows you to hear his voice when he's calling you to a particular vocation. And we can plant the seeds for our children to do that, especially if we show them examples of Catholics who are really giving their 
life wholeheartedly to prayer, um, which can include their own parents giving their life wholeheartedly to prayer. And that allows us to know what God's will is for our life. Of all the feedback on your books, and there's been a lot of parents who, who love one book or the other, I think I've seen the most people have feedback that listening for God has changed their home prayer life so much. Because I, I don't know what other Catholic book or, or Christian a, a book that teaches children about the power of... You're, you're like a modern day mama Cardinal Seurat about the power of silence <laughs> and, and translating that for toddlers. No one else yeah. has done that. That is humbling and high praise, and I will come nowhere near <laughs> earning and deserving that title. But I actually had been reading The Power of Silence by Cardinal Seurat leading go. up to that book. And so it really was very much inspired by my own search for more of that quiet contemplative prayer in my own life as a busy mom and wanting to teach my children those seeds of silent prayer. And what I love about the book, um, it was actually funny because there was an Amazon reviewer who had had made an assumption about the book without reading it, which was so unfortunate um, that, you know, this idea of, of si we don't seek silence as an end in itself. And that's ex exact. I completely agree. You know, we don't just seek silence to go into like internally into ourselves and stay there. We're, we're, we're seeking silence as a way to hear God's voice. And so the story actually uses the story of Elijah in scripture as the basis for the storyline and that idea of the still small voice. And he wasn't able to hear that still small voice until he quieted himself. And so children, as they're busy and, you know, just going about their days, it kind of listening for God allows them to jump and to roar, you know, like a fire and to, um, and to pound the ground like an earthquake and get their wiggles out and then encourages them to be quiet so they can learn those building box of blocks of prayer because we can't eventually hear God's voice until we learn how to be quiet first. And then in the book, I also mention in the back how we can hear God's voice in other ways in our life too. Because some children think, well, I'm quiet, but I can't hear God speaking to me. And it helps to encourage them by showing them that God is actually speaking to you already. He's speaking to you through his word. Every time you read sacred scripture, that's God's message and love letters to you. And he's speaking, you through, speaking to you through other people in your life. He's speaking to you through nature when he puts a rainbow in the sky after a storm. And so it just kind of helps children have a tangible way to start recognizing that God is trying to speak with them. He already is, you know, communicating with them. And that the more they practice that interior silence and listening for his voice, the more they'll be able to hear it in their daily life. So I do think that book was especially useful in our own home. And that's probably why it's been useful to many other parents in their homes, because it really gives us that launching point to teach our children um, how to be quiet <laughs> um, so that they can hear God's voice in their life. Everyone likes a little more quiet in their right. home. There's no one that says, my house is too quiet. I just, I can more like um, Katie, wrapping up with you here, what surprises you in your own, looking at this growing stack of books that you have authored now, what has surprised you about assuming this life of the, not just Catholic children's literature author, but also just a Catholic author in general? Yeah, actually, Mary, more than people commenting on any particular book, I do have people ask me very frequently, where do you find the time? And I think the answer is that I, I don't even know. Like sometimes I say, yeah, how, how am I finding the time for this? And I really believe that the Holy Spirit wants this work to be done. And so he's making the time. I'm like you mentioned, I am a homeschooling mom. I'm a full-time stay-at-home mom. My kids and my family life is my primary vocation. And I never want any work that I do to take away from that. And this beautiful children's book work, Mary. I'm going to, I'm going to say all this without crying. Just, just watch, <laughs> but it really has been such a blessing in our life because it only, it only brings life into the family and it doesn't take anything away. And I thank God for that every day because I am, I love reading beautiful children's books to my kids. And Meg and I got into this work because one, because I wanted her artwork to be available to more people because it's beautiful. <laughs> Um, and she's phlegmatic, so she could use a choleric that may, you know, help make it happen. But, um, but also because we really wanted our faith represented in a good, true, beautiful, and fun way while still being solid and catechetical to our children so that we could plant these seeds of truth in their heart and have these discussions and experiences that we really wanted to have with them over good books and to have 
Catholic children's literature that our kids were as excited to grab off the shelves as they were their secular counterparts. And so thanks to Meg and Amy and Leah and some of the amazing illustrators that I work with, they've really allowed that to happen because these books obviously wouldn't be what they were without the incredible artists behind them. And I'm just thankful for that every day because I've seen the impact they've had on my own children. I mean, my son still reads Jack Giorgio almost every day and wants to be a priest when he grows up. And, 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 and books can really change lives and they can change the hearts of young children. And I'm just, I'm, I'm truly thankful that I, that I get to do this work. And I feel like just uh, Mother Teresa once said that she was a little pencil in the hand of God. And I kind of, I feel like that when it comes to the children's book, I'm just your little pencil for as long as you want me to do this. I'm so thankful to be on this ride and I hope it can last for many decades because I'm enjoying it so, so much. And I'm very thankful to Tan um, for making these books so widely available um, to kids all around the world. Well, I know there are there are moms and dads across the country, probably actually around the world, who are grateful that you have taken the time to put these models of what children can be in the religious life out for all children to see, hold in their hands, think about every day, think about in the years to come. So thank you for all the work you've done on these. Again, the book today is Sister Claire Gets Ready for prayer. You can find it here on tanbooks.com and also at your local Catholic bookstore. Katie, congrats on another amazing, amazing project. Thank you, Mary. It's a blessing. Thanks for allowing me to share more about it today. Mm -hmm.